in the previous session we covered last month, February, we did an introduction on Otello. Um, that's now the Vector 3 and then Osprey Pro, um, our online and premium um, software. Um, and in today's session, we will mostly cover the installation of the Vector 3, some, some practical hints and tips on that. And then also, how do you commission the device to start recording and setting it up correctly? The focus of today's session mostly will be on how to commission that on Osprey Lite. Um, I know we have a lot of people from ESCOM in the school and, and a lot of um, clients that are still using Osprey Lite. Um, so today we'll mostly focus on that. I will also briefly do a demonstration on how you can do that on our web interface. Um, that is also new on the latest firmware on the devices. Then in coming sessions um, with the Osprey Pro, we will in later sessions cover how you do the commissioning on Osprey Pro um, and then also go into more detail on other advanced features that, that you can do in, on, on Osprey Pro, which you can't do on Osprey Lite. So um, not to waste any time, I think I'm going to go ahead with the presentation and the first thing that I want to just discuss again and quickly go through before we go into doing the physical installation is again the appearance, the physical appearance of the device and the specification. So um, in terms of the, the power supply and um, sorry if I sound like a, a repetition, I know I've covered some of this in the previous uh, session as well, but for those of you that's new, um, I would just want to go through this briefly again. So the power supply, the device can be powered in three ways. We have um, the ability to power it from AC um, and then also from DC and also power over Ethernet. So that's the three ways that we can power it. You can see this is the power supply terminal with a live, neutral and earth in the middle. So you can power the device from 90 to 300 volt AC or from 100 to 300 volt DC power. Um, if you, and we'll get to that also later, um, do not have 110 volt DC in the substation, but you have 36 volt DC, um, you also have the ability to power that over Ethernet. If you have a power over Ethernet switch or injector, with PoE plus um, capabilities, you can use that to, to power the device um, over that as well. Um, so next slide is then the voltage inputs. Um, so we have four voltage differential voltage inputs. The first three um, is your three phase voltage inputs, red, white and blue, um, with reference to your common, your fourth input. Then there's a differential fourth uh, voltage input that you can use to independently, sorry, I don't know why my slide changed. Um, there's also a fourth differential input that you can use to power separately to, to, to measure separately the voltage separately from your first three phases. So that would be, for example, if you want to measure your um, battery voltage or if you want to measure the voltage between uh, your neutral and your earth. The ratings of our voltage input is uh, 0 to 600 volt line to neutral or 0 to 1000 volt line to line. OK, we move on to the current inputs. Um, again, we will look at uh, specific applications of how you, you connect it, um, for example, later in the session. But there's two ways that you can measure the current on the Vector 3. The first and recommended way is to use the direct current inputs. Um, we have four, um, different, or four current inputs, as you can see on the screen. Um, each one of them or each phase will have an uh, input current and then a return current. So the idea is that you connect this in line with your measurement circuit um, with the current coming in and then the current coming out for each of the phases. The ratings of this is 0 to 6 amp uh, input range 
but we can have, we have a 10 amp permanent withstand or up to a, a 50 ampere a one second withstand. Um, then a very nice feature that you can set up on the software is to derive a third current or a fourth current, depending on, on what you record, uh, what you've connected. So in a, uh, a star topology of four wire network, you can use your three phases to actually derive your neutral current. Or in a three wire delta topology uh, network, you can use your red and the blue phase to actually derive um, your third current, which in most cases will be your white phase. Then the second way of measuring current on the device is using current transducers. Again, there's four transducer inputs or terminals, each for each phase, and each of the terminals, there's three inputs. So the image is a bit small, but if you look at the text, you can see that the, the top um, input of each terminal will be the signal. The middle input is a five volt DC power output. And then the third is a reference. So the five volt power output is used for um, transducers such as Rogowski coils or all effect sensors that needs, um, yeah, that needs five volt power for them to operate. The ratings on these inputs are, um, or the measurement range rather, is 1.4 volt RMS. Um, and again, you can also derive a third or a fourth current using the current transducer inputs. Right, going on to the next slide, um, we have our digital inputs. So there's two sets of um, two sets of two digital inputs. Um, there's two, it's two independent built in five volt um, wetting supplies, and then also a, a common for each one of them. These inputs can be sampled at 500 kilohertz. So you can actually uh, trigger waveform recording and monitors using your digital inputs um, that we have here as well. Then relay outputs, there's four relay outputs. It's, it's four galvanic isolated solid state relays. Um, the first relay are by default configured or set up to operate or, or to give indication or if the device is recording or, or not. So the first relay is by default configured to do that. The th other three relay outputs you can use to with or set up with your monitors. And I will show that in a, later in the presentation as well. Um, but these relays can operate in two ways. You can, for example, set the relay to, to, um, to close when there's an event that happens. And then when that event stops or ends, open back up. Or you can set the relay to be like a counter. So each time there's an event, the relay will close and next time it will open like a counter. Um, so that's the two different ways that you can you can set up to use these relays and you can obviously connect them with your um, or is under the control of your scalar protocols and as I mentioned set them up using the event monitors. Okay there's a built-in GPS um, that supports external active uh, external active antenna um, this GPS antenna can be extended up to 100 meters um, and it is can give you up to 100 nanoseconds clock synchronization, which is very powerful with our Osprey Pro um, software where we can do incident matching. What that means is, is that if there's an event in your network, uh, a dip that's seen on multiple of your Vector3 devices, that event will be captured on all of them and it will be grouped into one incident that we call incident matching. And we can do that because we have this um, 100 nanosecond clock synchronization um, on, on the GPS. So I'll get to more practical hints on that later as well. 
Okay, there's two Ethernet ports on a device. Port Sorry, one, hi. yes. Sorry, I, I see questions from Jock Wattle and um, Johannes. I think perhaps um, you want to answer those questions before going on. Okay, let me just open Can up I read it text. to you? Um, yes, you can. Well. So Jock Wattle is asking, is it still recommended that we connect the transducer ref inputs to Earth? Yes, uh, Jock, that is uh, recommended that you still do that. And the reason why it is important to connect, the, if I just quickly go back to that slide, to connect either one of the reference of these terminals to ground is so that we or so that you don't get a floating voltage um, reference here. So if you ground this, you 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 know what the reference is and you know that your measurement will be accurate. Um, also on this point, and thank you for bringing it up, it's important if you connect and we'll get to that also um, later, but to use a screened twisted pair cable um, when doing the installation for the current transducers. And the reason for that is that in substations, you get a lot of magnetic interference. Um, and because it's a very small voltage signal that's sent to the device, in order to ensure that you do not get interference on that signal, it is recommended that you use a screened twisted pair cable. Um, now we, we uh, as CT Lab also uh, um, can supply you with the installation kit that I will discuss later what's in that, but one of the equipments that's in the installation kit is specifically this uh, screened twisted pair cable that you can then use for your installation. Um, it is recommended to always use, or if possible, to rather use the direct current inputs um, before the alternative of using the current transducers. Um, that will, but that will make the installation a bit more difficult. You need to short the CTs, um, but let's discuss this later in the, in the presentation. Then um, also I have a question from Hanu. Um, in the voltage input slide, what does it mean that there is a third or fourth order polynomial to correct the VT nonlinearity? All right, um, so on that, or this could be as well, um, what that means is that, and actually specifically for the current transducers, is that what we've done is we've, we've tested the split core CTs, and because there is a nonlinearity because of the CT windings, we try to compensate for that by implementing a third or fourth order polynomial to basically remove that nonlinearity and also to, to do a phase shift because the, the split core will induce a phase shift um, and to basically compensate for that. But that's also specifically the reason why we recommend you rather use the direct current inputs to, to remove that extra um, layer of um, inaccuracy that can come into effect. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Hein, so is it is it a constant is the constant nonlinearity for all the um, for all the types of CTs? Like yeah, so so we for every if, if you do the configuration on you'll see that you can actually specifically select what split core you are using. So you, and so you, by selecting that split core, you then basically apply the specific, um, you know, specific uh, correction or polynomial for that CT. Now, remember that it was only tested for one split core, so it, between different split cores, there can also be a difference. OK, thanks. Yeah, that answers the question. Thank you, man. All right, thanks, Anu. Um, all right, let's continue on. Um, so I was saying with the Ethernet ports, there's two Ethernet ports, port one and then a port two. Um, port one, okay, this is actually just ignore the DHCP for port one. That DHCP should actually be port two, but port one is your corporate um, port. So port one will be 
the port that you connect to your corporate network um, and to provide the device with a fixed IP. Port two, as or you can also call it the engineering port, is what we use, or it's got a built-in DHCP server. So we mostly use port two for direct communication with your laptop. So if you're on site and you're doing the setup and the configuration um, to connect your laptop directly to port two. But please be aware or note that you should not connect that port two to your corporate network because of the built-in DHCP server that will clash with the DHCP server of your network, of your corporate network. So just bear that in mind. You can use either one of the two ports to power the device if you have a PoE plus injector um, available. And we also do have and can provide you with um, a PoE injector if that's something that you are interested in. All right, um, we'll get to more detail of, of the communications later on in the presentation as well. All right, the USB port is a 5 volt power port. Um, and this port we mostly use internally in ESCOM, uh, in CT Lab. And this port can be used to actually configure some of the settings on the device. For example, the web interface that we will get to later on in uh, that I will demonstrate will need to be or can be enabled by using the USB port. So the web interface is not enabled by default. There's certain settings and specifically the communication settings of the device that can be set up using your USB port um, and using a memory stick that you plug into that port. Um, but if you have any questions on that, um, I will discuss that or can discuss that in more detail later on as well. Okay. Next, we have our user interface. So this is just a, a number of LEDs and then two specific switches. The largest switch is the on and off um, switch, to which is used to power the device on and off. So you need to press and hold this button to turn the device on or off. You will know that the device is powering on if the status LED is orange. That th when the status LED changes from orange to either off, indicating that the device is then off, or um, flashing green, meaning that the device is operating under normal conditions and there's no error condition, um, and it was success successfully booted up. The second switch or, or button is a um, very small recessed button that's flat with the surface panel, and that button is used to connect and disconnect the battery from, um, from the Vector 3. Now, it's very important that you don't press that button too hard. It's a, it's a small um, button, so don't press it too hard. But also, when you do an installation, please take note to check if that um, or if your battery is connected or not. You will know if it is connected if the power LED is constantly green. So that will give you indication. Now, the this button is in most cases only use to factory reset um, or hard reset or reboot the device. Um, or secondly, if you use the device as a, um, a, a portable or investigation unit where the device is stored for a few weeks or months at time and you don't want the battery to run down, then you can disconnect the battery. And then when you do installation, you know you still have that that charge available in the battery as you had before. And otherwise you'll need to wait for the battery to charge up to a certain percentage before the device will boot up. Um, so that is one of the limitations on that. All right. Um, 
let's continue on then. We also have the external power LED. This will give you indication of if there's any of this power connected to the device. So it will just be off or green, depending on that. Then a charge LED, um, which will give you indication if the device is charging. So if the device is fully charged, then this LED will be off, or if it's obviously not charging, it will also be off. Otherwise, it will be constantly green. Then the record LED is to give indication if the device has been configured to record any trends or monitors. So please make note of that, that you can, that record LED will be on for both or either or um, if you set up trains or monitors. So just have to take note of that. And then the clock sync LED um, is used to provide to, if, if the GPS is connected, to give you indication that your um, device is synchronized with, with time as well. Um, currently, the cellular LED, from my understanding, is not um, in operation. So just take note of that as well. All right. Oh, last thing on this one, which I forgot to mention, please do not on site while the device is on, um, disconnect the battery. This can cause your SD card to become corrupt. Um, so please first turn off the device and then disconnect the battery or reset the device if you want to do that. Okay, then um, we have a built-in cellular modem um, and Wi-Fi in the device. So this is the way you will connect antennas to both of these. Um, yeah, the built-in uh, um, modem or the, the SIM holder is just underneath the front panel. So if you want to do an installation and you want to install your own um, SIM card, you can do that by removing the front panel and you'll see the SIM holder. It's just a normal SIM um, holder that, where you can connect the, or insert the SIM card. Um, please do not, while the device or while the front panel is open, do not turn or put the device head down or face down. Um, just before, you, yeah, just keep it on its back or be, close it if you want to do that. Daniel, I see your hand. Hi, we have a question. Um, Lynn Coles, uh, is asking, can you explain what you mean by disconnect the battery? Um, yeah, so uh, Lincoln, basically the the battery, this this button, as I said, is to remove the the basically the battery supply to um, to the device. So if you disconnect this, you can still provide power to the device and it will still operate. It will still work as normal if there's power to the device. But the moment that you remove external power. Um, the device will switch off and there's no backup power available. Um, so the battery disc will connect to make sure it's connected will just ensure that if there's a dip or um, there's an interruption, you're, you have backup power from the internal battery. And that backup power is for plus uh, minus um, 30 minutes to an hour that you have available on there. So. Um, and that's also why we mostly recommend that you connect the uh, or give power to the device using the battery DC in a substation, because that will ensure that during load sheddings or long interruptions uh, that the device is still powered. Um, the advantage of that is you have two advantages. The first is that you will be able to capture the end of the event. So let's say there's a load shedding event. When the power comes back, you'll be able to capture the start up and there can be current in rushes or um, events like that that you will need to capture uh, that's important for you. And also it will um, increase your lifetime that you have on the device by not discharging the battery that often. You'll obviously have a longer lifetime available on the battery. Um, Lincoln, did that answer your question? Thank you, I'm answered. 
Thanks, Lincoln. All right, um, I went through that. All right, so before I get into the installation of the Vector 3, maybe let's take a minute or two. Do you have any questions with regards to uh, the Vector 3 hardware uh, or what I would just went through? Hi, okay. Hope has a question here. Yes, um, thanks. In the chat box, um, she's asking, um, how, no, I think Hope, how would you know if the battery is connected or not? Okay, so um, the power LED will indicate if your battery is, so there's two ways. You'll firstly, you'll be able to see by looking at the switch. If the switch, if the battery is connected, then the switch will be reset. So it will, it will not be flush with the surface. So it will be pressed in, if that makes sense. But secondly, also, the power LED will be off. Um, when it's connected, the power LED will be on and um, yeah, the, the button will be pressed in. Okay, any other questions? I see a hand from Brandon. Um, hi, and can you just repeat that quickly? You say that if the button is not flush, then the battery is connected. That's correct, yes. So it's basically pressed in then, so it's it's then uh, connected. Um, okay. Yes. Sharon? See you hi, I, I, I know you. Yeah, good, thanks, and you? I'm good. Uh, like uh, when you're explaining the power button, like how it's supposed to be on and off when the battery is connected or disconnected. I think there's something that is missing there on your explanation because like what happened, like when the power button is on, it's like flash down, the like you have to put power in in order for the power LED, it will flash. It won't yes. stay green. It has to flash. OK, so it, does, it, it doesn't stay constantly green. Yes. So I think the client will be confused there because it like it like it doesn't stay like green, green, green all the time. It flashes all the time when the the, the battery connector is on. Okay, so it's it's not it's not constantly green. It's yes. flashing green. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, um, that's cool. Sharon also from CT Lab. She works in our um, yeah builds the instruments, so she's also very knowledgeable. You can ask her questions. Um, all right, any other questions? <clears throat> Hi, uh, I have a question from Leon, sorry. Oh, yes, okay, uh, Leon. Um, so he's asking in the chat, when using the direct current inputs, if you do not use the fourth input, must the inputs be connected to earth or slash neutral or left floating? No, you can just you can just leave the fourth um, input floating. Um, if you have, you know, in a four wire system where there's a neutral that you can measure the current, you can obviously connect the neutral to measure that. But as I also explained, um, if you just leave it floating, you set it up in the software to actually con to to derive the neutral current or the fourth current. Um, so you can just leave that floating and it's similar for the current transducer input as well. You can leave the fourth open, uh, but what we normally do with the fourth terminal on the current transducer is to use that terminal where we connect the, the earth because all the transducer terminals or the reference of the transducer terminals are internally connected to each other. So if you connect the earth to one of the terminals on the reference that will obviously um, be connected to the rest of the terminals as well. All right, uh, Brandon, your hand is up. Yeah, uh, and that was actually going to be my next question on the transducer uh, inputs. So you are saying that because normally what we do, we connect the phase one, maybe for, for the first phase, in the reference to the, uh, is it a split core cities? Is it those black yes. cities? So yes. you are saying that, that one should actually uh, connect the, the ref to, to Earth as well. 
Yes, so later on there will be, there's a slide where I show you a specific example of how um, I would do a whole installation with uh, uh, diagrams, but just if I can use my laser quickly, I would connect this reference on the fourth yes. terminal. Uh, make sure you use the, the not the middle. Uh, we've seen a lot of times people connect uh, the earth to the 5 volt power, um, or they switch the two around, or the reference and the 5 volt around. Um, the reference is the third or the bottom input of all of these terminals, and we normally connect this one. We just bridge it to the, if I quickly can go to that slide, to the power supply, we just bridge it to the middle pin here. Uh, which is then the safety earth. Oh, I was actually going to breach all of them. I was not aware that they are already internally breached. Yes, so you don't need to breach each one of them here. You only need to connect one and then internally they are breached. OK, thank you very much. Anne. All right. Thanks, Brandon, for that question. Any other questions? Only connect one. OK, um, if you have anything uh, or you maybe can think of anything, you can also answer or just give that in a chat box and we'll get to that um, or in the end of the session. So. So we're going to cover the physical installation of the Vector 3. Um, before we do that, some of the installation accessories that you can consider using. OK, I see actually there's a hand. Um, Bongumza, sorry, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Yes, no, that's one hand. Uh, sorry, a quick one, just before you step off from the previous slide. Yes. If you can just quickly go back there. Uh, which specific one? Uh, uh, the, the one that shows the, the connectors for the currents, just before this one. Yes, no. Um, I, I don't know, I've noticed that you see the middle connectors for the blue face and the white face for this vector three it is quite not stable when you put it in uh, as like the outer phase, the, the outer phase, uh, red phase and the neutral. So I'm not sure if is it, uh, it it's supposed to be like that, but it's not, if you put it, you insert it in, doesn't fit it like uh, stable as like the, the neutral and the, and the red phase. So you're talking about the physical physical connection. Yes, um, the physical, yes, the physical connector itself, the green part. Yeah, what I've what I've seen um, if you use lugs to do the installation is that sometimes the lugs is too wide. Um, and then when you want to enter it into, for example, that bin um, or that input, the lug presses against the side of that green terminal there. And then that can cause, um, as you say, maybe not the base of proper connection. So sometimes you need to turn the lock a bit uh, to get it in, but it's not supposed to be, um, if I talk about the other pins, more unstable or um, any difference than compared to the, the other terminal. So if you see you have an issue with a specific terminal, um, please let us know. Maybe it's a faulty or send it back in, but it's supposed to just fit as as probably and um, tightly as it would for any one of the other terminals. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any other questions? Lincoln, yes. Yeah, I think it's it's on the next slide because I saw you already moving on to the installation. Uh, on the next slide, I think you've got uh, two ports, I think, where you can connect antennas or something for Wi-Fi and cellular. Can yes. you really explain those a bit? Uh, let me just find that one. So this slide. Correct. OK, so um, it's the two Wi-Fi antenna where you would connect antenna for the, the Wi-Fi and then for the cellular antenna. The Wi-Fi antenna is a small stubby antenna. It's a small, um, or not a small, a short, if I can call it, black that you screw in here, where in the cellular antenna is a magnetic base antenna. So um, it's a it's a, got a bit longer cable, but you um, 
can fasten it magnetically, for example, on the top of a substation panel. Um, now, it is important for the cellular antenna that, that that cable or that antenna can't be installed far from the device. It's not an active antenna, so you need it close to the unit. What we have done for some installations where there's bad cellular signal um, is to actually install a high gain omni um, antenna. Um, and that antenna can be installed a lot further from the device and then can also be taken outside the substation normally. So um, I'm not sure if, if, if that will that, if that add more, more information to, to this. So the Wi-Fi antenna, and we'll, we'll get to the communication, different communications and how it works and how you set it up, um, is if you, you can basically set the device up as an access point, so you can connect directly to the unit uh, to do configuration, or you can connect the Vector 3 to a Wi-Fi network that's in the area of the device uh, to get um, cellular you know, communication with the device for remote connection. And then same for the cellular, that's also for remote connection. Um, so for clients that um, buy a, a license with us, an Osprey Pro license with a Vodacom SIM card, that, that SIM card will already be pre-installed and the device will already be pre-configured to communicate with our server and um, with the correct APN settings and everything. So, but that you can also manually set up in Osprey Lite, Osprey Pro or the web interface. Thank you for that question. Um, Okay, I think let's keep the questions until the end of the session. I still have a few things to get through. Uh, so before we get to the installation, physical installation, um, I just want to mention a few accessories that you can consider when doing installation. So um, the first accessory is, as we've discussed already, a split core CTs. Here's an image of the split core CTs. With each one of them, you'll get two resistors um, with a label on them with either one um, amp or five amp resistor. And that will obviously depend on um, the secondary of your CT that you are clipping this split core on. So if you have a five amp secondary uh, CT that you're clipping on, you will use the five amp resistor or otherwise the one amp. Um, and there's terminals um, on the back of the split core where you'll need to fasten them in parallel with your signal and your reference. All right, then with these is the screen twisted pair, which I've mentioned is very important for magnetic interference. That the screen twisted pair are included in our installation kit that you can also purchase from us. But note that the split core CTs are not. Um, all right, then shorting terminals. It's an image of the shorting terminals that's also included in the installation kit. And that's very important and that we also recommend you install um, when you're using direct current sensor. Um, and the reason for that is to in the future be able to easily short your CTs if you need to remove the device, swap the device or change anything in your Vector 3 installation. So you don't need to actually short the CTs, um, you know, with the, using the test terminals, but you can actually short them just using, just or short them just before your device using this um, shorting terminals. So we also recommend that you install that. Um, then for all the voltages, so that will be for your power supply and also for your voltage measurement inputs we recommend that you use fuse holders with fuses um, as well. We know some clients, they prefer to use circuit breakers. You can use that as well, um, but we still recommend fuses or fuse holders. Um, and they are also included in the um, installation kit. Additional to, to, the, to that is also a DIN rail that will also be included in the installation kit the locks that you would require, and then all the wiring, um, or all the wire that you need. No, so no tools is included, but all the equipment except for the split course 
will be in the installation kit um, as well. All right, so just a few considerations before uh, doing installation. The first thing would be where do you want to install a power quality recorder? Um, now, a power quality recorder should be installed at strategic locations, considering that specific network or what you want to achieve. Um, for example, you would install a power quality recorder where there is a specific power quality problem or where you need to do an investigation um, at the point of delivery or connection, example, for renewables, uh, where they need to prove critical compliance. Um, and for you also as a utility, maybe to um, record the, the renewable plant. Then um, thirdly, you, for utilities, you can or you need to install it at points where you need to provide or ensure that your quality of supply um, are within the NRA standards. And then also um, at key customers for municipalities, for example, where they have key customers that they want to um, measure. I think I saw a hand go up. Do you have any question? Uh, yes, and um, just here on the installation, in a case where you want to put it in a strategic uh, location, but there's no uh, uh, there's no um, where you can connect, like for example, the city so. city unit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it, there's no any maybe other ways of maybe managing that. Because, um, for example, OK, you can go. Yeah, that, that, that is obviously an issue um, and something that is difficult to, to, to uh, let's say, find an alternative. Um, what we recommend a lot for clients that don't have VTs um, is to consider installing low power VTs. So um, I, I, don't, I won't go into too much detail on, on, on that. I think that's a bit out of the scope of today's session, but Low power VTs is also recommended and will give you a more broadband um, measurement range or accuracy. So it's more broadband um, bandwidth compared to conventional VTs. Those, they are also cheaper to install and they can easily be retrofitted um, for most uh, switch in most switch gear installations. So we consider or we recommend that um, for the current, it's difficult. You can, for example, uh, but normally that's only on LV systems, is use Rogowski coils to measure, for example, the current around the bus bar. Um, so you can consider doing that, for example, using that sort of, uh, you know, transducer or device. But it is, yeah, further, it, it is an issue. Um, and Unfortunately, in most cases, you'll need to consider uh, installing additional equipment. Um, and you also want to stay away from protection circuits um, so that you ensure that you're not interfering with the protection, add more burden to the protection circuit, or um, yeah, rather if you have the measurement circuit or instrumentation circuit available, always use that for doing installation with the Vector 3. Uh, Brandon, uh, your hands up. Fine. You just mentioned the Rogowski coils now. Yes. Um, so we use those coils for, for measuring on LV. Yes. But on the instrument itself, which channel do we use? Where do we connect it on? On the transducer side or, or current input side or where? OK, so uh, Brandon, that Rogowski coils or all sort of transducer types, so split core CTs, uh, clip on CTs, Rogowski coils and Holofix sensors. There may be more to this list, but for example, all of them will be connected to your current transducer inputs. Um, obviously, make sure that whatever measurement sensor you are using is within the voltage range input of the device. So the Rogowski coil specifically needs five volt power, um, and that's why we have um, of why we bring a five volt oh, yeah. output power out, so that you can connect that also to your Rogowski coil. 
Um, the one alternative or the one um, yeah, that's not included in this list is um, the US current clamps. So that is uh, like a normal current uh, transformer. It, it measures the current and it provides you with the current output as well. In that sort of, when using that sort of um, a sensor, that is connected to your direct current inputs because this is a current input and this will be a voltage input. Is it now those big uh, CT clamps? Yes, that's correct, yes. But do you do you, do you provide them as well? Um, Cecilia, can you please come in here? Do we still supply the US clamps? Um, US clamps are available um, additionally, but they do have quite a long lead time at the moment um, due to the international component market warfare, I almost want to tell it. But yes, we, we can supply them. Okay. Thank you. And, and, uh, yes, and, and Brandon, we have three different, also to add to it, three different Rogowski cores that we can provide. Uh, 300 amp, 1000 amp, and I think it's a 3000 amp Rogowski coil. Um, so you, we have a quite wide range of options available um, depending on obviously your application. But then what is the difference between the 300, the 1000 and the it is just the, the input current that you can me measure using that um, Rogowski coil. So it, it will be, let me just give you a photo of how they look. I have it somewhere here. Um, so this is how the Rogowski coils look. And it's just, it's just a, for example, three, a 300 amp to um, a 0 0.3 volt input so for example using the 300 amp to 0 0.3 volt Rogowski coil because we have a one volt input on our transducer you can actually measure up to 900 and using that specific Rogowski coil otherwise it's going to you know it's it's the current's going to be too high um, so it's just depending on what your current rating is and what okay. current you're measuring OK, um, right, so let's get back to this slide. Some other important considerations before doing installation is um, just to take note of that if there's a specific problem that you want to investigate, that just note that that problem may be of statistical nature. Um, or if you measure for too short period of time, your data can be misleading. So it's always recommended uh, to do or when you do an investigation, for example, I'm not talking about permanent installations, but if units that specifically install temporary to install them for as long as possible, um, obviously to to get the best data um, and that's more better statistically as well. So sometimes there's seasonal factors that is also important, for example, during summer when there's high wind in Cape Town, you are more likely to have issues of trees, um, you know, causing dips on your network. Or, example, in the raining season where there's lightning in Gauteng, uh, you'll get more lightning um, impacts or statistical, yeah, or that season factor. So just take that into mind as well. Okay, now with regards to physically installing uh, a vector three. There's three ways that you can mount the Vector 3. The first one would be just using a rubber, the rubber foot pieces that's on the unit. So it's just to basically lay the device down on, on a surface. Um, now this small, um, what, what can you call it, panel or plate rather, can be installed or connected in different ways. So this panel can be brought out of a piece, yes, plate can be brought out a bit and you can then install a surface mounting. So you see there's holes that you can surface mount this unit or if you swap, um, turn the plates around, there's turn rail on, on the bottom of them that you can then connect the device on a turn rail. Okay, so let's get into how you would connect the unit. So in terms of the power supply, and I've mentioned a lot of this already, is it's 
important to first connect the safety earth. Um, when, when you do installation, always install that, um, that or do that connection first, but that will ensure that your whole unit um, is connected to earth. Um, so that's more a safety reason for that. Then we recommend to use 110 volt DC if it's, a, it's available. If you don't have 110 volt DC, you can consider to use 36 volt DC if you have that with yeah. a PoE injector and then connecting the output of that injector, uh, which is a LAN or Ethernet cable to one of the Ethernet ports to power the device using that. So both of these options will, in most cases, ensure that during um, interruptions or during load shedding, the device will be powered, uh, it will not shut down. Um, the battery will not um, obviously uh, run down and then turn off the device. Then thirdly, if none of these are available, could use the 230 volt AC supply or any, uh, not AC auxiliary AC supply. Um, if you have that, if you don't have any of the top three, then the last option is to connect or to power it from the 110 volt VT supply. Um, so that's the, the four ways that you consider to power it. Now, as I mentioned, connecting using DC will expand the lifetime of your device. So we also always recommend that option first. Okay, in terms of the voltage measurements, how you would connect that for a single phase um, connection is what we normally do is you connect your phase, uh, let's say whatever single phase you have to V1 and you bridge that to V2 and 3 so that the two voltages are not floating and then the neutral obviously of your single phase will be connected to your common um, input of the terminal. So um yeah so that would be on a 400 volt system you'll have the neutral connected here or on a 110 volt vt circuit you'll connect the star point to the common here and then you can always consider using the fourth um, input which is differential so it's independent from the other three inputs to measure the difference between your earth and your neutral or as i mentioned you can also measure your dc your battery DC voltage in the substation. And then in this case, you'll obviously configure it as a single phase topology on either Osprey Lite, the web interface, or on Osprey Pro. Going on to three th phase. So the three phase, you either have a three wire or four wire power system. So the vector three can measure line to line voltages or line to neutral voltages. Now, what does the NRS 048 say depending on how to connect in a three phase? So the NRS says that all phases of supply voltage shall be measured. In the case of a system with a solidly earth transformer and neutrals, the phase to neutral voltages shall be measured. And in the case of a delta connected system or system with impedance earthing, or that are on earth, the face-to-face -face voltages shall be um, measured. So basically the transformer of your network, your um, dictate of your system dictate the connection. So in a three wire system, you have three wires, you have your, and you're measuring your line to line voltages, and this will give you 110 volt input from your VT. Um, in a four wire system, you're measuring your line to neutral voltages, and then you have a 63.5 volt input on your voltage, um, yeah, voltages. Right, so let's first cover the three phase, three wire system. So I've drawn a, a diagram that indicates how you connect it to the device in this case. But just before we get to that, um, you can have two scenarios when you get to substation. You can have one scenario where you have an open delta VT, or you have a VT with a star point. Um, now, for both cases, we recommend you always connect your three phases, your red, white, and your blue, but you then breach 
the white to your common. Um, in the Open Delta VT um, one, the, 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 the white phase are normally earthed. Um, obviously, for the other one, there is a, a common or a star point which are earthed. Um, now, you can also, if you have this sort of configuration or this VT, you can connect that earth or that star point to neutral rather than using your or, or bridging your white face to common. Um, but we still, just to keep it simple, you know, simple, just recommend because you're actually measuring the line to line voltages is to just connect it like this. So red, white, blue, and then bridge it over to your common. Um, Another advantage of using this sort of connection in this case is that you pick the AC to DC converter will have give you better accuracy when you connect it like this because you only give it two input voltages. So you have better accuracy on your AC to DC converter than if you provide it with three voltages. That's um, or, yeah, three input voltages. So that's another advantage. Now, in this case or both cases, you would configure it as a delta topology. So meaning it's actually measuring your line to line voltage. OK, now the alternate of the, the other side is if you have a four wire or, um, system in a three phase network, you would connect similar your red, white and blue, but then your star or your neutral point will then be connected to the common, will always be connected to the common, because in this case, you're measuring the line to neutral voltages and not the line to line voltages, and you'll configure it as a star topology. OK, now if I go on to the current measurement. So the first thing that you need to find out on site when doing your current measurement are what CTs are being used. Um, is it a 5 amp CT or 1 amp CT? Um, now, as I mentioned already, we recommend that you always use the direct current inputs. So both of these CTs will work perfectly fine because we have a 6 amp um, input range on the direct current sensors. Alternatively, you use the 5 amp to 1 volt or 1 amp to 1 volt current transducers um, as shown in this image and you connect the, the corresponding um, resistor depending on what CTs are on site. And then as I said, always use the instrumentation or measurement circuit and stay away from protection. Now on a 400 volt circuit, you have the option of using the US clamps or clamp on CT um, that will um, measure the current and provide you with the current output. So this sensor is connected to your direct current input. The Rogowski coil can also be used and they are connected to the current transducer inputs. Okay, so for a single phase uh, measurement, if you're doing a direct, um, you're measuring the current directly, you would just bring your one phase in and out. Remember to short the CT if you're connecting on secondary of a CT to short the CTs before installation. Um, but the same for three phase. So the, the important thing is to always first, if you're measuring the current directly on a secondary of a CT, is to first short the CT beforehand. Um, and this will just ensure that uh, there's not an open circuit that's caused. And now when there's an open circuit on a, a, a secondary of a CT, that will cause a large voltage on that open circuit that can cause um, arcing. And that will definitely damage your device and it can also cause your CTs to blow up. So it's important to short the CTs before that and then also connect the shorting terminals so that in the future you can just short your vector three easily by um, just shorting it or pitching um, yeah, the currents at the shorting terminals. Now, as I said, you can configure the 
on on the Osprey Lite, you can configure it to the arrived and neutral current, so you don't need to necessarily measure your neutral in a four wire system. You can derive that using your three phases, or in a delta or a three wire um, system. Um, if you only have a red and a blue CT, you can use those two currents to derive the second one. And you can set that up on the software. OK, similarly for the current transducers, if for single phase, you'll only have obviously one transducer connected or one Rogowski coil connected to your device. Um, I've already mentioned that it's important to use the screen twisted pair and then to connect the safety earth to the common of one of the terminals. So again, we just recommend using the fourth terminal. And then similarly for your three phases, you have your red, white, blue. You don't need to um, put this uh, split core on the fourth terminal because you can derive that one, or if you want, you can also record it using a split core. So as I mentioned earlier, this is an installation example, a diagram. It may be a bit small. Um, I'll sh we'll share the slides with you afterwards as well. Um, but in a three wire system, so there's two ways two different ways that you're connecting up. Firstly, there's the three supply options. Supply option one would be to connect it to your 110 volt DC or auxiliary power. Option two, um, which is the last case you should consider, is to power it from directly from your VT. And so we just preach it from the VT to the power. And then the supply option three is if you have 36 volt DC, you install a PoE injector and power the device through that. Now that's similar to all of the diagrams. Um, and then you have your, your earth, your safety earth that's connected through a terminal. If we then move on to our voltage measurements. So on a three wire system, you connect your red, your white, your blue through uh, fuse holders with five amp fuses and you then breach that white face to the common. Um, and then if you're using the direct current me method, you have your, your red face coming in and going back out. Same for white, same for blue um, to the rest of the measurement circuit. So you measure, you're, you're connecting the device in line with your measurement circuit. And then in the case where you have transducers or using transducers, you would connect it like this. So the split core transducers, there's two cables that you need to connect. It's the signal and the reference. Um, then it's the twist screen twisted pair cable, and then you just clip it on the correct wire, secondary of the CT, for example. And then remember to connect that or bridge that earth, as shown here. Okay, in a four wire system, the only difference here is the voltages is that in this case you have um, a neutral voltage that you're also connecting um, to the unit. So that's the only difference in terms of physic physical connection. Okay, and then lastly, to finish off with the insulation part, um, Brad, I'll get, I'll, I'll get you a question now. Let me just quickly cover this slide, is that um, it's always always connect the terminals of the vector three properly. Um, so make sure that these terminals, green terminals are properly fastened. fastened. Um, we have seen cases where specifically for the direct current sensor, if you do not connect these uh, terminals by using the two screws, there's two screws on um, one on both either side of the terminal, you can cause a bad connection inside um, and that for specifically for the current sensors can cause an open circuit. Um, as I explained earlier, that will cause um, arcing damage to the device and can cause your CTs to, to blow up. So very important to fasten all of them properly um, so that you, you ensure that the connection inside is proper. We also recommend that you use lugs for all of the cables coming in, so that you have, you can screw each one of them tightly. Um, 
so that the cable or, or the yeah the wire them come loose from the terminal. Okay, um, always install the GPS antenna outside the substation um, and specifically in substation with a concrete or zinc roof. Um, Concrete and zinc will cause interference and bad signal with the GPS. And we've seen it a lot that the GPS then cannot lock or sync time. And what will then happen is your device will go to either NTP, so the network time protocol, if it's connected to a network that isn't as accurate as the GPS, or it will use the internal clock. Um, and in both cases, you will not get um, accurate timestamps and specifically if you want to do incident matching and if that's important for you, um, always install the GPS antenna outside. So we have a, it's a dome antenna with a, that we provide with a bracket. So you fasten a bracket outside to the substation and um, you also get, a, I think it's a 20 meter extension cable with each device that you can extend from your unit all the way out to where the um, GPS is installed. And then lastly, yeah, you just install the magnetic base antenna on the top of a panel. So that is the cellular antenna. So if you're using the cellular communication method or you can connecting remotely using cellular network, you just stick that antenna on top of the panel and there's a magnetic base. You can see it's difficult to see, but that is the Wi-Fi antenna. So it's just a, a short black stubby antenna. And then obviously you have your GPS going out and your um, cellular going out to your cellular antenna. OK, um, let's take questions on the installation. Brandon? Sorry, Brandon, I see your, your hand is up. Hi, I'm sorry, I was speaking while I'm still muted. Um, that antenna there, the, the one on the right, the magnetic base, we used to yes. use that one. But I see now with the new instruments that we ordered, we got some sort of like a like a dome. I'm not sure if it's the antenna, or, but it has two, two um, connectors. Uh, so I'm not sure how does one install that. Is it the uh, outside antenna or how does it fit into the whole installation? So Brandon, I think in, in that case, that is for the Vector 2s. Um, is it, are you specifically referring to Vector 3 or Vector 2 in this case? We, we uh, got it with the Vector 3s, but it looks like a dome antenna. It's not the, the long long one that is on this picture. Yeah, it, um, I, it can be that we are working over to using that. It's a, basically a, a MIMO antenna, so multiple in, input, multiple output antenna. That, that's why there's two connectors. But from my understanding, we only use that antenna if we have external modem, if you're connecting the Vector 3 to an external modem. So meaning um, we cannot use this antenna on the internal modem? I think you'll still be able to just connect one of that cables to the modem, but to be honest, um, I will need to just find out about that for you. I'm not 100% sure, um, but I know from experience that in the past, mostly that 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 antenna, that dome antenna, that's also a magnetic base, are used as an external power supply where you can connect both of the um, the connectors to the external power, or not power supply, the external modem. Okay. Did you did um, you receive external modem as well? Uh, yes. Yeah. So that thing it comes by default and standard with the external modem. So in your case, the only thing that you would do different here is that rather than connecting the the um, antenna directly to the unit to the internal modem, you will now connect the the vector three to using the Ethernet cable to that external modem and then connect the antenna to the external modem. Um, yeah, uh, but how do you attach? They, they do not have a magnetic base. I see they have some sort of a uh, double sided tape around it, so I'm not sure how to where we're actually going to 
Uh, I'm not sure how it does. Okay, but it's fine. We will. Uh, from what I know, and Cecilia, you can also come in if you know, but the, the, the dome antenna is definitely, with the two, the multiple input and output also definitely is also magnetic base. Um, you can, it may be that you've, you've received a PoE, a small PoE injector with a double-sided tape that you connect to the modem, and that is to power, um, yeah, to power the modem. Brandon, I will um, discuss it with Winston and then come back to you um, during the day, course of the day, but later today, just to answer your question. OK, thank you very much, Cecilia. Um, yeah, I think that's it. OK, thanks, yeah. um, Thank you, Brandon. Uh, we have more hands up, I think. Um, Lincoln, I see your hand. I know I was not first, but OK. OK. Um, you, you were talking about external modem. Uh, and earlier, I think uh, you were saying something about uh, Ethernet port 1 and Ethernet port 2. Yes. Uh, I know with the external modems, then we're going to configure them to our APN and all that. So which Ethernet yes. port are we going to use or is recommended to be used? Uh, it's port 1 that you use. So it will be port 1? Yes. So it's the it's the corporate um, port port one. And you're going to have to configure the instrument for the IP address and all that. Yes, yes. So okay. you provide you will set it up with the APN um, and then with the fixed IP address. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, I can just come in there about the external and the internal modem. Yes. So the, the external modem is mostly used with the Vector 2 because it did not have an internal modem. But since the, the, we've launched the Vector 3, um, that is mainly part, the internal modem is mainly um, used with the Vector 3. Yeah, it's just, it was, um, that, it looks like they received the external modem um, with the Vector 3. OK, we just need to clarify that, but um, just as yes. a note that that the Victors, one of the main um, features and upgrades of the Victor 3 from the Victor 2 is that it can have an internal modem. Yeah, that's the nice thing about the Victor 3, as Cecilia said, is this, the, the modem is built in, so you don't actually uh, need the external modem anymore. You can connect the antenna directly to, to the Victor 3. Uh, we have a question here from Kamati? Yes, uh, thank you. We bought the Vector 3 device, uh, but our package did not come with the connection wires. So can we assume that was just a mistake from your site and you can still request for them? Um, just to make sure, uh, um, yeah, uh, Cecilia, do you have a comment? Yes, so, so the Vector 3 um, does not come with the installation kit that Han referred to. So the the panel wires and this um, twisted screen cable is additional that is required. What does come with the Vector 3 um, is the extension cable, the 15 meter GPS extension cable, and then a 4 meter um, Ethernet cable. So that is the only wires that comes with the meters. Then the, the um, green connector sets does come with the meter and that you will find in the white box. So okay. The, yeah, the, we, we the are, installation is an also. added extra that is available. Okay, okay. Then uh, we'll just request for that uh, installation kit as an extra. Yes, you you can get all those items from stores like um, ACDC or any any electrical um, store. But we have found that when you use the installation kit and you get to site, it's got all the lugs and fuse holders and everything there, you can just open up the box and start working without running around on the day trying to find the things that you need. OK, noted. Thanks, Cecilia, and thanks for that question. Um, Noma, uh, see your hands up. OK, thank you, Hain. Yes, I just want to clear uh, Brendan's confusion. I also had that confusion when we received the instrument because we are used to having the these um, the, the 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 you see those uh, thin long antennas with the external modems. 
So now when we received the package, it was a bit confusing. But then we realized after that the that is the 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 antenna comes with the inbuilt modem that is in the in the instrument. So the we also bought the standalone modems. So you were right, uh, Hain, to say the those um, what do you call them? Those other dome like thingy. The, yeah, the, the, the MIMO uh, uh, MIMO antenna, yes. Yes, the MIMO antennas. Those ones they are specifically for the standalone modems. Yeah, just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Brandon, your answer. Yes, Sheila. Can I maybe just add there? The the dome antenna is specifically for the GPS. So I don't know if you can maybe just why um, point to your um, screenshot there exactly where the GPS is connected. Yeah, but yes, but there is the, the but, one. The the other one also for the modems. It's 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 smaller than this one. That's right. But that is the the yes, cellular yeah. antenna for the GSM. So if you look at the vectors three and you see the stubby, the, the Wi-Fi stubby antenna, mm -hmm. the, the connection point just below that is the cellular antenna. And that comes with a longer antenna, which is a GSM antenna. Yeah, yes. but, but but she's also referring it to is, the antenna that they received that, that's used with the external modem that looks okay. a lot like the GPS antenna. It's yes. also a dome antenna. Um, and it's also a magnetic more. base. It, yeah. it, it doesn't look like this. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yes. Uh, Brandon. Um, just a question on the twisted screen pair. Where is it used? Um, it is used with the, if I go here, yeah, um, with the current transducers. Um, so, Inside that screen twisted pair is two cables. Um, the one is a signal, one is a ground. Inside it's twisted and there's a screen, um, it's screened outside. So, and that is, as I said, for magnetic interference. So you use it with this specifically the split core CTs. Uh, split core CTs, is it the black ones that comes with the resistors? That is correct. It's these ones. Uh, let me show you. So it's we can't use this split cores uh, with uh, normal wires. We can, um, but we've just we have mo we have seen a few cases where specifically some substations got more magnetic interference than other, and that um, yeah basically interferes with your signal, so you get inaccurate readings um, on on the voltages. So you can do it. You can also manually, which does help, is twist the cables yourself. If you don't have a screen cable, that will also um, already compensate a lot for 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 that interference. OK, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, another question. Sorry. Yes. Um, the internal modem of this Vector 3. Um, I on, on, on Osprey Lite, there's an option where you configure the internal modem. But I see now like the APN that we are using requires a username and password. Um, but it doesn't, there's no fields for username and password. It's only fields where you can put in the APN name. So how can this work now with our APN? Uh, Brother, that's a good question. Um, I do not have an answer for you on that one. Um, can you please, can I please ask if you send me an email um, with this question? That, that we just can find that out. I will need to ask Travis. I don't think he's in the call um, specifically on this question. I'll drop you an email. Thank you. Fine. Thanks, thanks, Brandon. Um, OK, Lincoln. Thanks, Ayn. Um, I think the, my question now is around the external modems and the antennas. Um, most of our orders, we, we, we sort of ordered the Vector 3 uh, thinking is going to come with the, 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 the antenna for, for the internal modem and all that. And we added uh, external modems as well. But from what I'm hearing on the discussions, it sounds like only one antenna is going to come for the external modem. 
So question is, do we have to now specify to say we also still need the, the, the antennas for the internal modem or, or what? Because mostly we order those external modems for old vector tools that we still have that doesn't have uh, modems. Yes, so uh, basically to answer that question is that um, with the vector three by default or standard, the normal cellular GSM antenna that you directly plug in here to the internal modem always it always comes with it. It's always it's included in um, in that item. Um, okay. But you've also now separately bought the external modem, which is actually used for as you mentioned the earlier vector twos that's not got a built-in modem. So. Obviously, with that, you then get the external or the external motor, the antenna for the external modem as well. So if you want to use the external modem with the Vector 3, then you can. Then you're not going to use the, the antenna for the internal modem. But um, I don't see a real benefit of using that or doing that if you can just use the antenna that comes with the device and the internal modem. Yeah, that's actually what I was clarifying. So we will get two antennas. One yes. will be for the external modem and then one will be for the internal modem. Yes. OK, because I'm still waiting for my instruments, but it sounds like we only receive one antenna. Yes, yeah, um, I can't confirm that, but yes, that's that's you. You'll definitely get one antenna with the device and then if you purchase the external uh, modem, you'll get uh, another antenna for that modem. Okay, I see one more hand. Uh, good day, colleagues. Uh, my apologies if I have missed um, the discussion on the antennas. I just wanted to find out for interest sake, the GPS antenna, I see the one that came with the Vector 3 now, if we install it outside, so can we still use the one that we are currently using on the Vector 2s? Will it work perfectly fine with the Vector 3? Uh, yes, yes, it should work perfectly fine um, with the Vector 3 as well. The, the only big difference between the Vector 2 and the Vector 3 um, is actually the internal modem. That's, that's the main difference between the two. Uh, oh. the two devices so you can just use that external modem that you already have okay another one i'm i'm i'm, I'm not sure if it will be re relevant the external modems ne? the antenna it doesn't need to go outside you can still install it on top of the panel that is correct yes in most cases that is not an issue um as i mentioned earlier there is cases where um, the signal is very bad in rural areas. Um, then what we do in that case is we can provide you with a high gain um, cellular antenna. Uh, so it's got it's 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 got a better high gain. So the signal um, should be better. We've seen cases where still that causes signal to be bad, but in most cases then um, at least we get enough signal so that the device can send the data over the network. So, um, but so if you're interested in that, you can always inquire on that and, and we'll provide you with a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bon Gumza. Uh, yes, it, no, I just wanted to inform you and your team that I've just posted some several questions there on the chat uh, but we can just uh, we can just attack them when we finished i okay. didn't want to yeah thank you okay. thank you for that um okay let's i think let's quickly go through the um the communication of the vector three um that should hopefully answer some of the questions and then after that go through the configuration on osprey light um, and then we can we can do the rest of the questions so in terms of, of communicate, communicating with the unit, um, there's three ways, if we can call it that. It's You can use the modem that we've 
discussed quite briefly now. Um, there's a built-in modem, or you can use the external modem. Um, and that's obviously to communicate over a cellular network. It's a good option, uh, but it is normally slower than using a local network. Um, and you obviously set the, you'll need to set up the APN and the IP address of the unit uh, for, for, for the specific application. Then you can also connect the device to a corporate or local network using an Ethernet or Wi-Fi. So you have two options. You can either connect it to and specifically port one. So you will connect that uh, your, your device to port one and then uh, or port Port, you'll connect the network to port one of the device and then set up a static IP on the vector three. Um, now we can also, if security and encryption and all of that is important, we can also do a VPN tunnel or IPsec tunnel um, to have a direct connection to the unit, um, which will make it a lot more secure as well. And then, as I said, you can set the device up to connect it to a Wi-Fi network and you'll use the Wi-Fi infrastructure option um, in the configuration on Osprey Lite or the web interface or on Osprey Pro. And then lastly, there's a direct connection. If you connecting your laptop directly to the unit, um, there's two ways to do that. It's first is to use a LAN cable and connect your laptop to Ethernet port 2 um, of the unit, or you can set up a Wi-Fi access point on the device and then connect your Wi-Fi to that uh, the hotspot or to the access point that was created on the Vector 3. Just important that Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi is not on by default. So you will need to first actually connect it via Ethernet to enable Wi-Fi, or alternatively, as I said earlier, also use um, a memory stick with um, that you plug into the Vector 3. Now, I'm not going to explain it in too much detail. You can read more about that in the user manuals, the Osprey Lite and Vector 3 user manual. There is a specific section there that explains how you can set up the communication settings of the unit using um, a memory stick. So the, the basic concept is that you need a certain folder structure on your memory stick, uh, memory stick and um, depending on the folder structure and name of the folders, the, the device will pick it up and um, basically using script enable or disable certain settings. And that's also how you can enable the web interface. The web interface is not enabled by default, and that's also a security reason, um, because the unit's got a default username and password that you can log into the web interface. And you don't necessarily want that availability to everyone. So or you know, just for security reasons. So um, that can also be enabled using the memory stick. So a lot of the settings can be done, specifically communication using a memory stick and then a certain folder structure. Um, and for more information, just, yeah, as I said, refer to the user manual on that. Um, but it's important that on that memory stick, you need the um, key file, so the device key file, and we'll get to that actually now basically on the next slide. So if we, let's start talking about the configuration on Osprey Lite. Uh, the first step is, will always be you need to register the instrument um, on Osprey Lite. Now this is required on Osprey Lite as well as on Osprey Pro. So on both of these options of software, you will need to provide the software with a, um, the meter key. And that meter key is located on the memory stick that we provide with the unit. Um, so you'll see it's literally a dot key file and you will need to um, basically import that key file in your software. Now on the web interface, um, you do not need 
a key file. You can log in directly and set it up without a key file. And that's also why the security was important so that, you know, not anyone can just log into the web interface and change any settings. Um, OK, so step one to configure the unit would be to register the device. And you do that by going under the setup menu under register instruments and by clicking on browse. You will browse on your laptop to where that key file is. Um, as I said, most likely on the memory stick. All right, so and then once you located it, click on it and click on register and that will then add that device or that meter to your address book. Under communications on Osprey Lite, there's a specific menu address book and that address book will contain the list of all the meters that you've registered on your laptop. And this will be unique for every user. Um, my Osprey Lite and my address book will look different to someone else's because I've registered different instruments on my Osprey Lite. OK, so that is an important concept. Um, before I continue, in the latest Osprey Lite build, there's also a Get Started menu, the Add New Device. Um, I'm not going to go step by step through that specific menu because it's actually just the same steps as I'm going to follow now. But if you don't know where to click or where in the menus to go and you want to add a unit to Osprey Lite, you can just follow the wizard. If you click on add new device, it will open a wizard that step by step take you basically through what I'm going to explain um, going forward. Um, I see there's a hand from... Daniel. Hi, I uh, just wanted to double check. Um, so Osprey Lite is basically the software we use to configure the device. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so Osprey Lite, you, you can use that to configure it, but you also to view the data. Um, so, and this is now for offline views. So I'm not talking about remote connection. So Osprey Lite is our free software um, that's available to all clients that you can configure the device, but also import data or download data and then view the data graphs in, in terms of trends and graphs and reports. Um, okay. okay, so the even like setting up IP yes. addresses, you would use Osprey Lite. Yeah, you can use Osprey Lite for that as well, okay. but actually you can do that on a web interface as well. So if you don't have the Osprey Lite software on your PC. Um, as I said earlier, the web interface is on all the new devices on the latest firmware. So if you have your device is on um, the latest firmware or for the last few months, you should have the web interface on the device. And on the web interface, you can do all the configuration as well. So everything that I will go through now, you can do in a web interface as well. But the difference is that the web interface, you cannot use that to, to view the data or to analyze the data. So it's only for configuration purposes. OK, and then final question is if we have some old units on site uh, that we haven't commissioned yet and that USB is probably lost somewhere, uh, how easy is that to solve? Um, so you can, if you read the user manual, see what folder structure you, you need um, for configuration, but if you don't have the key file, and that's the issue, uh, you can always contact us and we'll go through the correct procedure to basically um, share the key for that unit to you. So we can't just send it out to everyone, but we'll go through the correct procedure and provide you with, um, yeah, with the key file, if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Danielle, I see your hand. Um, hi, I see Johannes asked the question in the chat, but I don't know if you want to answer all these questions at the end of the session, session so you can just say what you'd prefer. Yeah, I think let's quickly just go through this. It's a few slides, not too much. Um, and then we'll do the rest of the questions on the end because I see we only have 20 minutes left um, already. So. Um, we can always extend a call for those that's still available 
um, if there's more questions. OK, uh, step two, after you've now registered the device on Osprey Lite, as I said, under the address book, you will be able to see it. So if you navigate to address book, under meters, um, your that specific device that you've just registered will now be on the list. OK, so step two is actually to establish connection to the unit. Now, I mentioned earlier that for configuration purposes and specifically using the web interface and Osprey Lite, you will need to normally directly connect to a unit either through Ethernet cable to port two or using Wi-Fi. If your Wi-Fi is not enabled, um, we mostly prefer and recommend using Ethernet port. It's also more stable. So you connect your, your laptop to port two and then the device will dish out an IP to your um, to your laptop. So you don't need to put your laptop in a specific IP range or any of that. The DHCP server within the Vector3 will provide you with an IP. So the only thing you need to do is navigate to address book and meters and then find the device under meters. You then click on the device and click on discover the device should then come online. If you still see that there's an issue with the device not coming online, I would then recommend that you click on the unit and then there will be a pop-up on the right side of the Osprey light. I don't have it now on the screen, but there will be a, a page on the right side where you can enter an IP address, okay? And that IP address is by default 192 .168.7.1. So enter that into the IP um, address and then click on connect. So at this point, the device should um, should come online. You'll see a, 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 a you know a green light or green LED that shows you know label icon that shows it's online. Um, yeah. If you still at this point see that. You, the device is still not coming online. We, it's important to obviously check that the device is on, but also update to the latest version of Osprey Lite. So some of the latest firmware on the devices are not compatible with old Osprey Lite versions. So make sure that your Osprey Lite is on the latest version and you can get that on um, our CT Lab website. Um, you'll be able to download the latest software version from there. Okay, um, going on. Step three um, is to create then a meter point. So now the unit is online and you want to set up the meter point. You do that by going to under the setup menu, configuration, and clicking on create. I see, sorry, this red is not in line with create, but Click on create and there will be a, a pop up where you need to provide the name, the description and then some of the, the configuration settings that you need to, to set up. So um, what you then do is you'll need to configure the voltage channels and your current channels. So with this is you need to select your topology if it's star, delta, or single phase, as I mentioned earlier, your voltage level, and then your declared voltage. Um, so as a tip here, in brackets, there's a percentage difference to your voltage level. You always want that to be, or in most cases, want that to be 0%. So if you set up the declared voltage incorrectly, you will get an uh, indication here that it's not correct. So for line to line, or um, delta topology, your declared voltage will be the same as your voltage level. But for um, a star topology, you will need to calculate what your declared voltage is to your voltage level um, to, to just get your line to neutral voltage and not your line to line voltage. All right, then obviously you have your supply frequency um, and you need to enter your VT ratios. So you can see there's two ratios that you can enter. There's, there's one for your channel one to three, and then one separately for channel four. So as I said, you can measure something independent on channel four compared to 
channel one to three. I see a lot of hands up. Um, can I please ask that we just do that in the end of uh, the slides, please? Um, all right, so yeah, so you have your, your, your VT ratio that you need to enter here. Is there a specific issue with the slides? Danielle, I saw a comment. Yeah, are we still on slide 30? Because I hear you are talking about something different from what I'm seeing on the screen. So I'm Is wondering that's... maybe I'm behind. Oh. Sorry for no, that. I'm uh, seeing the latest. I'm seeing the latest slides. Um, don't know if it's perhaps just the problem on your side. Um, Cecilia, could you confirm wh wh what slide you're seeing before you? We are on slide 36. Yeah. Yes, that's the correct slide. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. My network. To... Then I'm still on slide 30. Okay. No, I'm sorry for that. Um, we will share the recording with you afterwards um, if you just want to refer back to them to the correct slides. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So once you've set up the voltage channels, the next step is to set up your current channels, and that would be to select what input type you're using. So are you using the direct current sensors or the current transducers? So you select that from the drop down list. Then if you're using the current transducers, you can select the specific CT or split core CT that you are using. Um, and that is, as I explained earlier, to do that compensation um, on that CT that we've um, determined and done test and calibrated beforehand. And then you have your rated current and your ratio that you need to enter. So the ratio will be either your CT ratio or a combination of your CT ratio with your split core, the ratio of your split core then. Um, and as a tip, there's a calculator button that you can click on where you can enter that CT ratio and that transducer ratios that will easily for you then calculate your overall ratio if you are uncertain. And then again, channel one to three are separate from channel four. So um, if you don't, not connecting anything to channel four, you you can enter anything there. It's not going to make a difference. What is going to make a difference is that there is a specific option derived channel where you can select if you want to derive a specific channel like the neutral or a secondary current. And then also you can invert the current polarities. So if you find that you've connect, connected a transducer the wrong way around, uh, you can invert it in the software. Um, you don't need to do that physically and then click on commit. So at this point, you've set up the meter point with its name, description and all its PT and CT ratios. But it's still not recording. So what we normally recommend is then step four is to just verify that you've set up that correctly. To do that, you can go to the real time view and then under real time view, select your meter point and click on continuous read. Um, and we normally use, I normally use view two to just make sure that your voltage and your current that you're measuring are correct. Um, a nice way to confirm this is by to look at your, your voltage and current vectors. Your, so your red current and your red voltage should obviously be in phase. Um, if it's a delta configuration, then your current will obviously be phase shifted um, by, by 30 or more degrees. So, but it will still show in basically the same direction as your voltage. If you see that your red current is, for example, 180 degrees um, out of phase, then you know you need to change the polarity. So it's a good way just to confirm that you set up your VTNC to ratio correctly. If, you, if you're happy, you can go back to configuration. Um, okay, so just a few tips here. So check your voltage and current vectors, as I said, your CTs have a polarity. Um, if the current is small, it's going to be difficult to confirm this because uh, if the load is small, you, you won't necessarily um, get a good representation of your current. So it's difficult to then confirm the polarity. For most loads, the current will lag the voltage. And currents can lag by 30 degrees or more, depending on your impedance and your um, 
best capacitors with, in the network. And um, it can be more, yeah, for line to line, it will be more than 30 degrees. Line to neutral, your current will most likely be a very small phase difference with your voltage. And then most likely in most applications, your power factor will be uh, 0 0.9 lagging or better. OK, step five is now to set up the device for recording. Um, the first thing that you can set up is your trend recording. So again, you go back to communication, you click on the specific meter point that you've created, and then you click on the trends tab on the top. Um, this is where you now need to set up what trends you want to view. 10 minute trends or record one minute. There's a lot of things that you can enable here, but important and, and we recommend that you do not necessarily or without knowing just enable everything. By default, just enable your 10 minute intervals, 10 minute harmonics and min max. Um, and the reason why we say this, we've seen clients just tick everything because they do not know what to select. And this can lead to data corruption and it can also lead to data loss. You only have that amount of space on the, um, the device to store the data and the device can only store data at a certain rate. So if you are busy recording data quicker than it's storing data, your data is going to become corrupt and you're going to lose all data as well. So only enable trends that if you want to enable more trends, for example, one minute trends, and it will give you uh, one minute um, timestamp data is if you do a specific investigation and only also do it for a short period of time. Um, as I said earlier, otherwise you're going to lose all the data. Okay. Then next is monitors. And remember to click on commit. Um, if you click on commit, you'll see that a record, there will be an icon, record icon, come up here that shows the device is now recording trends. OK, then if you go to the next tab, monitors, is where you can select what monitors you want to enable for event recording. Again, <laughs> sorry, no more, you have a question? No, no, apologies. Oh, OK. Um, so again, here we recommend that you only enable three phase voltage tips and swell by default. Um, for the same reason as for trends, if you enable everything without setting up the thresholds correctly, it will lead to triggering a lot of events. Um, and again, that can lead to data loss and data corruption. So by default, enable three phase voltage dips and swell. And if you click on that, <clears throat> sorry, three dots, the, the uh, button there, there will be a pop-up window come up where you can set the thresholds um, and what diagnostic data that you want to download. So you have your thresholds that you can set up and then what diagnostic data and for what period before, during and after the event you want to record. Okay, now um, this is unique for each specific monitor. So each specific monitor will have a certain threshold that you can set up. If that's now current or voltage or whatever the case is, it will have a certain threshold that you need to set to trigger a waveform recording. So there's a few tips also with regards to this. Again, as I said, recommended to start with three phase voltage tips and swell. Um, incorrectly configuring other monitors can lead to an excessive number of events. This can cause data corruption. Um, OK, we recommend or it's a good idea to use monitors to investigate specific power quality problems where you need more high frequency data or waveform data. Um, so that would be at 50 kilohertz sampled waveform data. So it's a good way to set up monitors um, to investigate other sort of issues. If you're unsure what the thresholds should be for a specific monitor, let's say, for example, you're experiencing 
a voltage transients, but you're not sure what threshold to set up. A good tip for this would be to enable that monitor. So enable the voltage transfer um, transient monitor, but disable all the diagnostic data. So when there's an event that triggers, it's going to come up, it's going to be in the list of events, but there's not going to be any data to view. But you'll still be able to see what was the peak voltage and current and all of that summary of data. Um, and this will then give you an indication of if that threshold was set up correctly or too low, for example. So it's triggering too much. So then you can uh, increase the threshold. Until you're happy with that, then you enable diagnostic data to actually record waveform data. So it's just a tip, tip on that one. Okay, that basically concludes the setup. So once you've set um, set up all your monitors and you click on commit, then it's it's basically recording um, trends and monitors, and you just need to wait for data to uh, to accumulate on the device, um, where you can then later download the data to your laptop to view. Um, and that we will cover in more detail in the next um, next session, where we're going to in, in detail go through how to download data on Osprey Lite, um, export data, and how to analyze and view data specifically on Osprey Lite as well. Now, I wanted to demonstrate the web interface, um, but we only have four minutes left. So, um, Cecilia, what do you recommend we do? I think, Hein, um, if there is any more questions, people can put it in the chat and we can get back to you um, via email on that. Um, also, please look out for an email that Danielle will send out um, with the links and um, more information on, on the things that you've requested for that. So I think use the last two minutes for the last two slides. And if everyone is happy, um, our time is caught up with us, but we will see you then in the next month's training. OK, so thank you, Cecilia. I'm going to quickly jump out of the presentation and just going to share my um, my screen with you. Of course, I want to show the sorry, open the web interface. OK, so I'm already logged into the web interface. Um, to do, I just want to show you how you would do the same thing on the web interface if you want to configure the device and set up a meter point. So I've explained a bit in the previous session um, last month on how to log into the, the web interface. You can also get um, with the device, I think on the memory stick, we provide a documentation or a document that will explain the features of the web interface and how you can log into it and use it on the unit and how to enable the web interface as well. Um, so please refer to that if you have questions, but how you would set it up um, a meter point on a web interface is very similar to Osprey Lite, um, but actually my recommended way to do it because it's a more step-by-step -step process. So once you're logged into, you can navigate to your measurement point. And under the measurement point is where you then need to set up all the details. So you can see uh, for this specific meter, I've already set up uh, a meter point. But in your case, you will just provide um, the name and some description. And then there will be a button that you can click on to next. If you click on next, it will take you to the next tab where you then need to set up your uh, topology, your voltage level, and your declared voltage. Exactly the same as Osprey Lite. You can then click on Next. Again, this is where you set up your VT ratios on the left side, and then your CT ratio on the on the right side of of the page. It's it's basically exactly the same as Osprey Lite. So you have your ratios, and you can invert it, um, and all of that. And then the next one is to do your configuration. So that's where you would enable what trends you want to view and what monitors you've set up. Um, so it looks a bit different. Um, it's actually more like Osprey Pro to set it up, but the process is the same. It's just more step by step in here. So you then click on next and in the end you'll click on save. Um, once you click on save, 
to make sure that you're correct or, or happy with your setup, you can go to a real time view and you can actually just read the real time view to to just make sure that you are happy with um, with what you set up. Make sure your voltages are correct, your currents are correct and your vectors for your voltage and currents are as you would expect. And that's basically it. Um, so my recommended way would be to, if you don't have Osprey Lite, it's just to use the web interface. And the nice thing is, is that once you've set the measurement point up on the web interface, if you then afterwards connect it to your laptop using Osprey Lite, once you've registered the unit, that meter point will already uh, be on your list of meter points on, on Osprey Lite under the address book. So you don't need to set it up again. All right, so sorry, I know that was quick, but um, yeah, thank you for for attending the session today.